So, um, thank you for your patience there. Uh, yes, so uh, as you can see, I'll be talking about um, using um, adaptive optics to enable us to go uh, deeper in three-dimensional imaging, uh, particularly in super-resolution microscopy. As Mark mentioned, over the, uh, over the many years, we've been working on developing um, super-resolution, uh, developing adaptive optics for a whole range of microscopes, including what you might call conventional resolution microscopes, such as the three examples shown at the top here, and um, super-resolution microscopes in the examples at the bottom. And in each of these cases, what we're doing is using adaptive optical elements to compensate for the problems caused by specimen-induced aberrations, which means that as we focus deeper into the specimens, we start losing the resolution and contrast of these microscopes. And um, in recent years, this has been developed for super-resolution microscopes, which are far more sensitive to these aberrations than in the conventional uh, methods, which is why I'll be concentrating on those uh, today. And this work has been done with a whole range of different uh, collaborators. And um, of course, I'm presenting this on behalf of them. I'll mention them as we're going along, uh, but also, also thank them uh, directly at the end as well. So the principle of adaptive optics is this, that we take our microscope and we include in there a, an adaptive optical element, which enables us to control the phase of the light. So if you're thinking about, a, take an example of a laser scanning microscope, which is shown here, where you take the laser beam, pass it through an objective lens and you'll be scanning around the uh, focus inside the specimen. But the specimen, because it has variations in refractive index, will introduce phase aberrations. And so we use the adaptive element to, in this case, pre-modulate the wavefront light to cancel out whatever distortion is introduced in the specimen. And a similar argument can be applied for the imaging path as well, where we can use the adaptive optic element to correct there as well. And this is the basis of any of these adaptive optics microscopes. The elements we use to do this are either deformable mirrors, which is a reflective membrane whose shape we can change by applying forces with an actuator structure, which is a, 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 a built into the mirror, or we use liquid crystal spatial light modulators, um, which serve a similar purpose to change the phase of the light, but do this by changing the properties of liquid crystal uh, materials, which are uh, present uh, above every pixel in the spatial light modulator. And we use these, uh, sometimes both of them together, often separately, uh, use them in different configurations. So for example, a deformable mirror is particularly useful in fluorescence microscopy, where we have typically broadband and non-polarized light, because it behaves like a mirror. Uh, the spatial light modulators tend to be best suited to use in laser illumination, where we have uh, narrowband and uh, polarized light. But as you'll see, we'll use uh, either or both of these in some of our systems later on in different contexts. Now, the other part of adaptive microscopy, this is the correction part. The other part of it is how do we actually measure aberrations? And originally, the main use for adaptive optics was in astronomical telescopes, where these methods were developed to co compensate for the distortions introduced by the atmosphere, and the variations in density of the atmosphere. And um, in those systems, you tend to use a wavefront sensor, which will actually measure directly the distortions of the light wavefronts, and use that to control a correction element in order to remove the uh, to remove the aberrations. Um, these methods can sometimes be used in microscopes, but are um, relatively restricted in which context you can use them. So the approach we've generally taken is a more indirect approach to aberration measurement, um, which we call image-based or wavefront sensorless adaptive optics. And the idea here is that we will use the adaptive optical element to intentionally introduce aberrations into the system. And through a sequence of appropriately chosen perturbations, we can then uh, gather, gather a sequence of images, uh, which will have, for example, have different qualities, different brightnesses, because they all have different aberrations in them, but they will contain collectively enough information to allow us to correct the aberration modes, the types of aberrations which, uh, which are built up by the, uh, introduced by the specimen. And um, a lot of the work we've done has gone into working out how to do this in an efficient way, uh, so we can actually uh, do this form of correction with minimum specimen exposure and um, uh, minimum time. And so just to give you an idea of typically how long this can take if we optimise it, we can often do this measurement in a matter of a couple of seconds uh, uh, before we actually start doing our imaging tasks. Now, as I said, we've developed this for a whole range of different microscopes. I'll be concentrating mostly in this talk on, the th on uh, particular types of super resolution microscopes and explaining how, what we've been able to achieve there. Uh, but we have applied this to other ranges of microscopes as well. And indeed, we've applied this also to the um, Aurox Clarity system. Um, and so um, this is the outline of what we're actually, uh, what we're actually uh, looking at here. We have 
uh, the way you normally have the Clarity Confocal module attached to the uh, microscope stand. In this case, we've inserted in between a relay system which allows us to use a deformable mirror to correct for aberrations. And we introduced here uh, one of these image-based uh, feedback systems to allow us to correct for aberrations of the specimen uh, and get optimum imaging out of this. So in this particular case, we're imaging deep into a specimen as a refractive index mismatch, and we're using this system to correct for um, spherical and other aberrations which are present in the system. And so we're able to use this with different uh, sectioning strengths, uh, which are present in the, in the clarity system. Uh, we can go down to different depths and adjust the correction to optimize the, uh, the brightness we get from the images there. And we can also do multi-channel imaging. So in this case, we've got three channels um, in a Drosophila neuromuscular junction specimen. And you can see very clearly from the right-hand column that after doing the aberration correction procedure, we're able to get much better contrast and um, resolution out of the system. We can see features there which were uh, blurred out uh, before we were able to do aberration correction. So we can see that the adaptive optics can also be applied to the uh, clarity uh, imaging system as well. So move on from these, what we might call the, the, the more sort of uh, conventional methods of microscopy here, onto the uh, main topic of this talk, which is about super resolution microscopy. And I'll be showing you examples of how we've been able to benefit the quality of imaging in these methods in, both, in these three types of microscopes. Single molecule localization microscopy, stimulate, stimulated emission depletion or STED microscopy, and structured illumination microscopy. Now already in this session you've heard some things about that which is very useful because it means I don't need to explain all of the, the background to this and I can move on to the, showing you the details of what we've been able to achieve with the aberration correction. So let's look at the first one here, single molecule switching localization microscopy. So optically, at least in schematic form, the, um, the optical system is relatively straightforward. We have a collection of lasers in order to um, illuminate the specimen, excite the fluorescence, and that fluorescence is then generated by the specimen, passes back through the specimen where it becomes aberrated by the specimen structure. It then passes off the deformable mirror onto the camera. And the deformable mirror is used here only in the emission path because that's the only path of this microscope where the aberrations actually matter doesn't affect the illumination path because we're doing flood illumination. And uh, as you as was discussed before by Curti, the, um, the image formation of this involves taking a whole sequence of blinking, single molecule blinking images, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images, and then reconstructing them into a super resolution image, as the one shown in the, in the bottom right here, where you can see that the reconstructed super resolution image shows far more detail than the conventional image. Um, now, the uh, way in which aberrations affect this microscope is that they affect the quality of each of those point source images. Each of those molecules has an image in, uh, captured by the camera. And if there's aberrations in the system, that, that um, point source image will be blurred. The point spread function will be blurred. And this means that the when we go through the fitting routines, where we're fitting the, um, fitting the em emitted light to a known model of the microscope imaging properties, the point spread function of the microscope, uh, we find out that there are errors because there's a discrepancy between the aberrated point spread function and the ideal one we're using the fitting routine. The consequence of this is that the fitting routine fails in some cases and we lose some of those data. Uh, also, in some of the ones where we've actually been able to do the fitting, the precision of the fit will be lower and therefore we end up with a lower quality image. And that's what you'll see in the results I'll show you. So, for example, here, what we've done here is we've used the deformable mirror in this system to intentionally introduce some astigmatism. And that astigmatism is used to shape the point spread function to enable us to extract uh, the axial position of the emitter. So not just where it is laterally on the camera, but also whether it was above or below the focus. And you can see on the bottom left the, how the focus shape changes because of the astigmatism we've introduced. So the colour coding and the, and the images in the right show you how what the axial position of the emitters would be in these particular microtubules. Now what you see in these two images is quite clearly that when we've done the aberration correction, we see far more fits included in the final image than in beforehand. And the reason for this is that we have been uh, able to make sure that the uh, data we get from the microscope fits more better the model we are using to extract the final super resolution image. Um, and so We've, this shows how we can do three-dimensional um, single molecule microscopy using a standard single objective um, microscope, 
But we've actually taken this further in our collaboration. This is a collaboration we're doing with the Babersloft Group in Yale. Uh, we've taken this further and extended this to, um, to a, what we call a 4Pi microscope. Now, let me explain the 4Pi microscope configuration. Here we have the single objective lens configuration, which is what we used in the previous system. And of course, as any of these systems, the point spread function is determined by diffraction. And so we have this slight elongation on the optical axis, of course, which is just the nature of focusing and, uh, in high numerical aperture lenses. Uh, but what we do now is we combine this interferometrically with an opposing objective lens, which is placed in the other direction here. And when we combine together the effects of this, we simultaneously image through both of these lenses, through uh, the rest of the optical system, which I'll show in a minute. But the net effect of this is that we have a different point spread function shown on the right. We have uh, both the, the, the shape we saw before of the point spread function, but now it's got an interference effect and superimposed upon it. So we see uh, a major lobe in the middle and then these, these inter like interference side lobes um, at the side. And um, with a small amount of image processing, we can then use this to extract much better, much more precise information about the axial position of these microscopes. So we get full collection through both of these objective lenses. We collect more of the fluorescence, but we also gain more information about its position. Now, let me show you how this is actually put together in the rest of the microscope. So you can see here uh, the uh, arrangement closest to the objective lenses. You can see the two objective lenses on the left hand side there, which I showed on the previous slide. And then what you see here is the rest of the the interferometric cavity, which, where we, which enables us to get this interference effect from the light um, coming out of the specimen. And what you'll see there is that we have two deformable mirrors, one in the upper path and one in the lower path. And we need these, my, these two separate objective lenses because the light which passes through the top objective passes through a different part of the specimen than that which passes through the bottom objective. So those two paths of light will suffer different aberrations. So we need two separate mirrors in order to correct for those. The rest of the system here, the image separation path, um, is designed such that it introduces uh, different phase shifts into different paths. And actually what we do is we create four images on the camera where, we, where the image plane is, is um, indicated there. And I won't go into the details of how that works, but what we can do is use the combination of information in those four images to allow us to extract the, the Z position of the, of the emitters. And um, We've, uh, we've used this to do imaging inside uh, thicker specimens. This particular, the basic design of this without the adaptive optics had been developed by others uh, previously. Uh, by putting in the adaptive optics, we've been able to extend the capability of these systems so that they can now work over much thicker specimens than we had before. And I'll show you an example of that here. So if I can get this video running. So what you'll see here is an animation of is an animation of the um, imaging process here. So it's a mixture of a cartoon and genuine results. So the white flashes you see are an animation of what's happening as we're acquiring the images. We see this whole tens of thousands of, um, of blinking images which we acquire as we gradually move uh, down through the specimen. And what you see appearing above that is the reconstructed three-dimensional um, representation of the, of the data we see at super resolution. And what we're able to do here is change the aberration correction as we go through the different depths of this specimen um, in order to make sure that we can maintain the optimal imaging properties all the way through. And the aberration correction is essential here because previously these, uh, these methods worked over depths of around about 400, 500 nanometers. Uh, but because we can now step through changing the aberration correction, you can see here we've been able to go through cells uh, up to several, uh, several micrometers now. So we've been able to extend the capabilities of these microscopes. Now, if you're interested in this type of uh, microscope, then I can refer you to uh, a paper which has just recently come out in Nature Protocols, where we explain everything you need to know about how to implement your own uh, version of this microscope, uh, with the caveats that you'll need a lot of time and a lot of money. But assuming you can get hold of that and you have the patience to work through the 356 steps in the, uh, in the uh, build procedure, then you will also be able to uh, reproduce images such as the ones I've shown here. Um, so that is the end of the part of the talk about the single molecule um, microscope, microscopy. I'm going to move on now to the uh, next section of the talk, which is about STED microscopy. And again, fortunately, we already heard in a previous talk something about this. Uh, I will not go through all of the background, but I will explain to you the basis of the imaging process and how aberrations affect it. So. 
The idea is stimulated emission depletion microscopy is we excite the fluorescence using a focused laser spot. <coughs> we then use a second laser to create a depletion beam, which is structured so that it has a zero intensity point in the center. And so when we uh, combine these together through appropriate, uh, appropriately in space and time, we can create a stimulated depletion, stimulated emission depletion effect, which in effect switches off the excited fluorescence where the depletion zero has non depletion beam has non-zero intensity. And so the resulting fluorescence is determined by the remaining zero points in this, this depletion beam. And if we turn up the power in the depletion beam, we can get more and more of this depletion effect. And so we can squeeze the region over which the remaining fluorescence uh, is present. And that is how we get super resolution in this microscope. Now, what's vitally important in this is that you do have something, an intensity at the center of this depletion beam, which really is very close to zero. Uh, if it isn't close to zero, when you turn up the power in this depletion beam, you just start switching off the fluorescence in the center of the beam as well. And so uh, because aberrations can affect the quality of this here, it's quite important if you want to go deep into specimens uh, to be able to uh, compensate for aberrations in order to do this. And this is particularly important when you try to do the three-dimensionally resolved versions of step microscopy, which are more susceptible to these aberrations. So in highly simplified format, I can show you the, uh, the configuration here of the microscope. We have um, the basis of this microscope consists of a, an excitation beam, which is used to excite the, uh, the fluorescence and a, a, an emission path, which goes through onto the detector. Those two paths there essentially constitute a confocal scanning microscope. We have the additional depletion path labeled as STED here, which goes through a spatial light modulator. And we use that spatial light modulator to shape the beam. So it has this zero intensity in the center of it, but also to do some, uh, some aberration correction. You'll notice also there's a deformable mirror in the common path. So this can be used to correct for aberrations in the excitation path, the detection path, and the depletion beam path, because all of these are affected by the aberrations, even though the depletion beam is the most critical part of this. And we've uh, used this alongside our um, image-based sensorless adaptive optics routines in order to correct for um, aberrations introduced by specimens. So I can show you this example here where we're imaging uh, inside a Drosophila fruit fly brain. And what you see in these images here are X, Y, and X, Z slices um, through, through this, this section of the brain. About, this is about 15 micrometers depth inside the specimen, one five micrometers. And um, what you see here is actually the resolution is very close to what you'd expect from a, a um, confocal microscope, even though we're trying to do super resolution imaging here. And the reason for that is that the aberrations have essentially filled in that zero of the depletion beam. And so we're just getting a a uniform depletion effect and no super resolution enhancement. If, however, we perform the aberration correction, this is what we see. Um, it's a lot brighter, it's a lot sharper. You can see particularly in the XZ slice, if I just switch between the two, you can see that some of the details are, can be seen there which simply were not visible beforehand. So it's very clear that the aberration correction has increased the brightness and the uh, resolution of these um, 3D stead images. Just another example here, this is, uh, rather than being in tissue, this is just a cell inside uh, just on, on a cover slip and um, in this particular case you can see that because of the refractive index mismatch even just going a few micrometers inside you can see that the aberrations had um, seriously affected the performance of this and by correcting them we can see much more clearly the, uh, the, the uh, definition of this particular membrane which is being observed. So in tissues and in cells this type of aberration correction can be of great help. Um, but we've also pushed this um, super resolution work in stead microscopy further by combining it with a 4 pi uh, stead configuration as well. Um, this is uh, termed AO ISO stead. So as I say, it's a 4 pi version of the stead microscope. And I'll quickly show you the uh, layout of this. So uh, I obviously won't go through every details of this, but point out the salient points. You may recognize on the left hand side something that looks similar to what we had in the single molecule microscope before. We have the pair of objectives here next to the four pi interference cavity. We have two objective lenses, one in either, either path for the same reasons we mentioned before that we need to correct for different aberrations in both those paths. And you will see here that there's a spatial light modulator and this is used to, um, to shape the, uh, the uh, depletion beam, uh, which is used in this case here. And so all of these things combined together with a great deal of uh, experimental effort, uh, mostly carried out by Shang Hao, who's in, uh, in working, working in Yale when he did this. And um, we've been able to show that we can use the adaptive optics to improve the ability of these microscopes to work in, 
uh, through, the, through, through the depths of whole cells as well. So just to show you an example of the difference between the convocal microscope image we would get out of this uh, here, and we switch across to the eyes of stead mode. And you can see that whereas in the confocal, um, confocal model, we couldn't distinguish between these microtubules. Also, if you look at the color scale, this was looked like it's all at the same depth. But if we move into the uh, isostead mode, you can see the three dimensional resolution we can get out of this, uh, which was not possible before. And hopefully if this video runs, you'll be able to see uh, a lot more detail here as we move through the cell. And so you really can right the way through the cell, see uh, this enhanced resolution. all the way through the cell. Um, yeah. So um, we've also extended the idea of doing adaptive optics instead microscope to uh, much more significant deep tissue imaging. And indeed we've combined this with two photon uh, microscopy as well. Uh, and this paper is actually now published in, uh, in Optica. And we've been able to do two photon um, uh, stead, it's two photon excited stead microscopy deep inside um, tissue. Uh, so you can see some examples here of the different modes we've actually operated this in. You can see clearly in the XZ slices that we've got much more enhanced uh, three-dimensional resolution. Um, but the, the uh, really, really sort of significant demonstration we're able to do here is shown in the video where we've actually been able to uh, look 200 micrometers into fixed brain tissue. And you can see the differences here between this is the three-dimensional resolved two photon stead microscope and then we'll switch off the aberration correction and show you what we had before. So you can still get two photon uh, signals out of this, but you can see they're very difficult to see, they're very dim and the resolutions aren't very good. But by using the aberration correction, which we'll switch back on in a second, then you'll see that the, we really have been able to resolve a lot of these uh, dendri dendritic structures deep inside uh, this brain tissue. And in the paper you'll see other demonstrations as well where we've been able to do um, uh, chronic imaging of, of live mice with this as well. So let's move on to the final section of this, which is the third type of um, super resolution microscopy, which is the structured illumination microscopy. And um, the, the idea here is that we, uh, we use structured illumination patterns in a what would otherwise be a conventional uh, wide field fluorescence microscope in order to get super resolution information. And the key thing here is that we need a system which allows us to project illumination patterns onto the specimen. And we do this by using a spatial light modulator to rapidly switch between the different patterns we want to do. They will excite the fluorescence in the specimen. On the, when we project that light into the specimen, the pattern is affected by aberrations introduced by the specimen. Then we have to image the fluorescence back from through the specimen onto the camera. And that will also be affected by aberrations. So we use a deformable mirror in the common path, as you can see in this diagram, in order to simultaneously correct for the excitation and the emission uh, light. And um, the deformable mirror is ideal for this because, of course, it works for all of the different polarization, uh, different po the, the random polarization of the fluorescence, and for all of the different fluorescence excitation and emission lines that we need to use. I'll show you um, the uh, layout of this particular system, which we call Deep Sim. Uh, in this video here. So uh, here we have uh, several excitation lines which are combined together and are then uh, passed onto the spatial light modulator. This is placed in, a, in an image plane. This is imaged into the, uh, onto the object in order, and we put the uh, spatially structured uh, sinusoidal uh, illumination patterns onto this and switch between them. This is then imaged through onto the uh, deformable mirror, which, as we said, collect, corrects the aberrations here in the illumination path, passes through uh, into the back of the objective lens, which of course creates the illumination patterns. The fluorescence is then collected back through the same objective lens. Oops, sorry. Fluorescence is collected back through the same objective lens, passes through to the deformable mirror, which corrects for the aberrations induced on this emission path, and then passes through onto the um, cameras, two channel cameras we have here. And so that's the, the whole system in overview there. And if I show you the uh, real photograph of that, you can see the complexity of the system on the optical bench. Up in the top right, you see the, uh, the lasers. In the top left, you see the uh, upright microscope stage. Um, there's spatial light modulators in the middle at the top. The 
cameras are in the bottom right and the deformable mirror is in the bottom left. There's also a, uh, an interferometer built into this to allow us to have online characterization of the deformable mirror as well. Um, now, one of the things we had to, we had to uh, develop in order to make, to, to make this effective was a method of, which, of uh, sensorless adaptive optics, which is best tailored to structural illumination microscopy. And there's a challenge here, and the challenge is that um, uh, often what we do in here is we look at the spatial frequency content of the images in order to infer what aberration correction is needed. We use that as our feedback metric to allow optimize our systems. But depending on what specimen you have in there, you have different properties. So in this case, I'm showing two images at the top. One is of a random array of fluorescent beads, and the other one is of a, of a fluorescently labeled cell. And if you look at the, free, the Fourier transform of these images at the bottom, you see a very big difference. For the random arrangement of beads, you get a good coverage of the whole optical transfer function of the microscope, which is why this looks, uh, this looks like a circular distribution. Whereas in that, because we've got a lot of structure and it's highly oriented structure in this particular image, you can see that we have particular um, dominance of particular spatial frequencies in the frequency content of the image on the bottom right. And this is, it makes it a challenge for, um, for optimization schemes because we want to optimize for all frequencies and not just those which are dominant in the image. So what we did in order to alleviate this problem was introduce this method we called isosense, which involves projecting onto the focal plane while we do the aberration uh, measurement procedure, a pattern which has high spatial frequencies in it. So the pattern on the left is, what, is like a checkerboard pattern is what we used, then it has the frequency content shown on the right. And what this does is it forces into our image spatial frequencies of the type that we want to correct. So spatial frequencies close to those which are the uh, the patterns we would use for this structured illumination image in the subsequent steps. And so if we do that, you can see an example here where we've projected this, this pattern onto a specimen and you can see the frequency content taken from the image now has components at the higher levels. So we have some information there to enable us to optimize this particular correction. And so we, we would, uh, we would uh, take this particular spatial frequency band, we would optimize the power in that band and we could then run through our sensorless adaptive optic scheme with the different aberration modes in order to correct for this. And you'll see from the images on the right, if I flip between the two images before and after, that it's very clear to the eye that after this process we have optimized those particular spatial, uh, made, made it much clearer the imaging of those particular spatial frequencies. We then, once we've done that aberration procedure, switch to the SIM mode. We take the multiple images required in order to do the, uh, the SIM by projecting the different patterns on the SLM using this aberration correction we've already worked out in this step here. And if we look at those images now, um, first of all, I'll show you the wide field images from this microscope before and after correction. And in here, you don't see much difference between the before and after images because the wide field's not so sensitive to the aberrations which are present. However, the super resolution mode of the microscope, the SIM mode, is much more sensitive. And so you can see here in these images that the right-hand image has got much better definition, much better quality, lower background, uh, after we've done the aberration correction. Um, we've also uh, taken this further and done multi-channel uh, imaging of this. And um, in this particular case, we're looking at uh, the uh, Drosophila neuromuscular junction. And you can see here these images before correction. What we've done in the middle uh, Pat here is actually just made the, bef the, the before correction images were quite dim on the reconstructed images because because the way the aberrations has essentially obscured the information we needed to retrieve. So we've made it brighter in the second one by increasing the brightness by a factor of five. And on the right hand side, you can see the image after we've done the aberration correction. This is about 25 micrometers into this particular specimen. If I zoom in on those areas here, you'll see more clearly uh, the detail which we've been able to retrieve by doing the aberration correction. Um, so we're now able to use this system to get um, much better quality um, SIM images deeper inside specimens, such as these examples here. And this is now being developed further to allow us to, uh, to, to actually do uh, biological investigations using this method. So uh, to conclude my talk, we've seen how we can use uh, three-dimensional, uh, we can develop uh, adaptive optics to enable three-dimensional super-resolution uh, microscopy in these three different modes. And what we're doing with this is we're now pushing these developments further. We're trying to push across the whole of microscopy, not just, not just in super-resolution, we're trying to push the limits. We can operate with depth, speed and precision, we can do this. 
We're also concentrating on enhancements in usability and applicability. Uh, and one way we're doing this is by creating a toolkit of methods which will enable wider adoption of adaptive optics in microscopes. And if you're interested in finding out more of that, then I'll refer you to our um, website here, aomicroscopy.org, where we're uh, gradually building up a whole collection of um, protocols and hints, tips and tricks which you can use uh, to assist people in setting up adaptive optics in their own microscopes. And so please refer to that and uh, I'd be happy to answer any more questions about that separately later. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who contributed to this, the members of my own group, uh, my collaborators in biochemistry, uh, where with particularly with the co-supervision of, uh, of Ilan Davis and Ian Dobby, uh, we've been working on the, on the SIM microscopes and the 4Pi uh, single molecule microscopes. Um, collaborates in the, the Institute of Molecular Medicine, and also particularly um, uh, outside of Oxford in Yale. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been working very closely with the Odd-Babersdorf's group in order to do the um, single molecule microscopy and the STED microscopy. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge their contributions as well, and those of the funding bodies who've enabled this research. So thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Um, Kurt, he's asked, um, how does your four pi um, uh, single molecule microscope compared to IPALM. So, um, sorry, Martin, did you did you hear me? Sorry, Mark, I think you're speaking, but I can't hear you. <laughs> so, there's a question. I think Kirsty's asking. Um, so shall I shall I answer the question, Mark? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can't I can't hear you, but I can answer the question. Kirsty's asking a question. I think except for the Aurox confocal, you showed adaptive optics um, with every advanced microscope. What are the bottlenecks here? Um, what are the bottlenecks? Um, I'd say the biggest bottleneck is just the the difficulty of operating advanced microscopes, uh, which, are, which many people work with them are, they, they are, they are a, still a challenge. Uh, and adding adaptive optics into that is, is, is st still requires a lot of, uh, of um, other challenges to overcome. Uh, this is why we are working on uh, producing protocols and so on, which enable this to become much, much easier. One of the challenges is that until now, um, every microscope we've developed these things for has required some variation on the, say, the sensors adaptive optics procedures. And um, we've been working on making these more generalized so that hopefully people can then uh, can then adopt the tools with very little tweaking in order to actually use them in their, their own systems. So hopefully that will remove many of those, those um, bottlenecks. Okay, 